what is your theory about war? How, how does Bitcoin prevent war? Yeah, let me answer. I would like to define freedom maximalism, actually. Um, and then I'll, I'll answer that question. So typically maximalism means you're going to maximize a metric at all other costs, right? So if you were a, what's that dangerous, they always talk about the, the hypothetical dangerous artificial intelligence, if it was a staple maker, or maybe it's a paperclip maker, right? that it would just maximize paperclip production at the cost of everything else in the world. And before you know it, we'd all be drowning in paperclips. Right. So maximalism is typically used as a derogatory term. And I believe Bitcoin maximalism was originally a derogatory yes, term from Vitalik. But I want to speak, I think freedom is specifically unique. Um, and I've had it out with actually Balaji on my show about this. He's like, you can't beat maximalism. You want to talk about more optimalism. So you want to maximize a certain metric within some limiting principle, right? So you're, you're not drowning in paperclips, so to speak. Freedom maximalism, in my view, though, is I want everyone to maximize their freedom in terms of freedom from coercion, freedom to do things. So this would be actually, as we accumulate more capital, we're basically giving ourselves more options, right? We can do things that we couldn't do without that capital. Um, you said you flew here from Dubai, right? That was not an option 200, 300 years ago, right? Just didn't exist because we didn't innovate that. So I think freedom maximalism is maximize freedom within the limiting principle of the private property of others. Yeah. So it is self-optimizing because property itself is an expression of freedom. It's the fruit of your past freedom. So I think the ideal world is everyone maximizing their own freedom within the limiting principle or within the boundaries of the private property, which is the freedom of others. So I think it's a self optimalizing to use the Balaji term ideal. So when I say freedom maximalism, that's what I mean. Like just on that point then, why would you why do you regard yourself as a freedom maximalist rather than a Bitcoin maximalist? Because I think Bitcoin Mac I clearly support Bitcoin heavily, but this idea I see it in the Bitcoin community that they become toxic. They want to attack people for their portfolio construction. They want to moralize people for their anything, communications, assets they hold. I just don't believe in that. I don't want to be a part of that culture. I'm not going to go shame people for what they buy. Buy whatever you want. I'll see you in the marketplace. <laughs> My money will outcompete yours, or so I believe. Maybe you're right. Maybe you'll outcompete me. I have no idea. And to try and attack people, it just feels very high school. Um, and I think it's also decremental to experimentation. Like, let people experiment. All these shit coins, like, I consider them to be mostly test net for Bitcoin. But that doesn't mean I'm going to like dogmatically attack people and write these long treatises about why Ethereum sucks. And like more power to you. If you want to do that, that's fine. But I personally want to identify with the deeper principle. You know, Bitcoin's the greatest implementation I think we've ever had of life, liberty, property, which is freedom. But I don't want to dogmatically associate myself with a culture that I just don't identify with. So in terms of Bitcoin fixing it then... Talk to me about war. How does Bitcoin essentially prevent war? Because I, I believe that that's what you say, right? Yeah, and I want to be clear about this. Oftentimes when you talk about these big topics, people just think in binaries. It's like there's either war or there's no war. Right. It's like not necessarily. I, in my opinion, everything in reality exists on a continuum. So and the, the premise behind this thinking is, you know, there's the old Charlie Munger quote, Show me the incentive, I'll show you the outcome. So we have these institutions called states. They're monopolists on violence. They're charged with preserving the property rights of their citizens, right? Keeping the peace so people can trade and increase wealth. But they tend to bump up against other states, right? And uh, people being the territorial species that we are, um, and the state being a business, I think this is very important too, that all human organizations are businesses. So they're all growth oriented. They're all trying to grow, all trying to expand revenue, trying to become more profitable. This includes government. This includes your church. This includes every 
organization or club you've ever been a part of. Like it has to have more economic inflows than outflows, otherwise it doesn't exist, right? This is it's Darwinian in a way. So throughout history, you know, we had the issue where we needed to, and I, I'm just going to say we needed to. I'm not 100% sure we needed the state uh, so much as it's been imposed upon us, but we'll just say we needed this security outfit to preserve property, to have trade, basically to have economies. Well, when those economic enclaves bump into each other and they're they're both trying to grow, right? They're both trying to expand their territorial footprint. What happens? Conflict develops, typically over resources, also over land. Uh, it gets painted over with a lot of moral bullshit, like, oh, we're, we're capitalists and you're communists and we need to bang our belief systems together. Uh, this is a, a point I deeply disagree with Peterson on. He thinks it's not economic. He thinks we go to war over our belief systems on principle. Completely disagree with that. Because war is the most anti-economic thing you can do. If you can't pay for it, then you can't do it, then you're going to lose, basically. So that's been the norm of human history. Um, but when you get into a world, again, where you have this, in, this property right independent of the state, Bitcoin being secured by the mining network, you can no longer fund warfare through inflation. This is really important because the atrocities in World War I and World War II of the 20th century, the scale and scope and severity of war was unlike anything we had ever seen because of the central bank. Historically, governments or these states would bump into each other. They go to war. War is the most expensive thing you can do. They could only fund that warfare from their own balance sheet, from their own war chest. So typically, two states go to war, someone gets in financial straits, they cut a deal, they sign a treaty, there's an armistice, whatever. Well, when you install a central bank, all of a sudden, that balance sheet or war chest that they were confined to, their own um, monetary reserve, is now expanded to the entire savings of civilization. Because they can print money to keep paying for, for the war effort until they hyperinflate the currency and collapse. they confiscate all the wealth in the entire country versus just the state. So again, this led to the overgrowth of the state and therefore the overgrowth of warfare, basically. So by virtue of Bitcoin existing as an option to opt out of that inflationary um, environment and that inflationary means of funding large-scale warfare, states now have to go back to the original means of funding war, which is explicit taxes, like I'm sending you a bill, or borrowing. This is much more visible and visceral for people. I think the numbers, the U.S. war on terror was something like 80,000 per U.S. household. Wow. Right? That's crazy. But it was all printed. So if you showed up at someone's household with a bill for $80,000, like, hey, we're blowing up some people on the other side of the world to preserve some oil interests for me and my buddies. I need you to pay this bill. That's it, wild. People are going to put up a lot more resistance, right? When they're, when it's, you can see it versus just printing money and no one understands it and everyone just feels the pain. And then when prices increase, right, the actual tax is being inflicted, what do government bureaucrats say? Oh, it's the greedy capitalists. It's the greedy gas stations, why gas prices are up. It's the greedy food manufacturers, why, why the cost of food is increasing. They'll say anything but debasing the currency. So they can obfuscate this behind people's ignorance of money. And I think over time, basically Bitcoin just, first of all, through what we're doing, just talking about this, this decentralized media and educational effort, I think people are waking up to the realities of monetary inflation as they're feeling the pain, right? Like something's not right here. Even if people don't understand cognitively what's going on, people in their procedural body, knowing they feel something's really wrong. And so I think states are just going to keep pushing mm -hmm. and this creates a pressure on people to learn more and find alternative means of saving and preserving their wealth and being independent of the state that creates capital inflows into bitcoin and so as bitcoin continues to grow these lessons spread and now when a country wants to go to war they're going to have to go tax and borrow because people because capital if you try to inflate the currency to pay for that war capital will leave your country so it's, I see Bitcoin as a disincentive to warfare in the long run. And the final piece of that is 
Bitcoin custodied properly is really hard to steal. So if you ever had a central bank say on a Bitcoin standard, when Nazi Germany invaded Poland, they they win the, the war or the, the invasion of Poland, they go straight to their central bank, seize all their gold, right? They just had a very expensive war effort to do that. They need to go recoup their costs. Well, rerun that on a Bitcoin standard. It's like you would invade Poland, go straight to their central bank, and there'd be nothing there. Presumably, you'd, the central bank would have custodied it and multi-sig or whatever, and there'd be no carrot, right? There's no carrot to warfare at that point. So you're reducing the size of the, of the carrot to warfare, and you're reducing the ability of states to fund warfare via inflation. So this is like a massive tectonic incentive shift away from warfare in the long run.